Today we meet an American who left the state of Texas, moved to the country of Sweden, and his life unfolded in a way I could best describe as uh, movie-like. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Indy Nidell. Here is the uh, one and only Indian Idol. I've, yeah. I've said that about a thousand times about you, but uh, funny because we come in six packs, so, uh, yeah. so <laughs> really not one and only. That was a line from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, by the way. It was Zaphod Beeblebox. They said, "Wait, you're the Zaphod Beeblebox? No, a Zaphod Beeblebox. We come in six packs." So. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to find a new catchphrase. Uh, you, you call me the uh, the just okay Ryan Sokash. If yes, memory serves well. Okay, Ryan Sokash. <laughs> yeah, but so, you're, Indy, other than that, you're quite good, Ryan Sokash. <laughs> well, I have a better internet connection uh, than you do. That right. much is a problem. Yeah, that's true. Point. That's true. I'm, I'm actually down, I'm in uh, Burn Reed outside of Munich now with um, Spartacus and Astrid, who I do the World War II channel with. We've just been filming on the D Day, 24 hour D Day stuff. So, I'm here till tomorrow. So, I'm not in yeah. Sweden moment so. i'm excited to see what comes of that you know i was with you guys and actually i, I want to bring that up a little bit later in our talk uh, in the gossip section of our talk um, but for starters tell me how does one move from texas gunslinging steak eating all-american state to the innocent sweet little country of sweden those are really bad descriptions of both of those places <laughs> <laughs> i'm a uh, stereotyping bastard yeah it's, it's okay um well you mean how does one if one choose chose to do that then i don't know i did not i i when i left the states i didn't realize i was leaving the states i thought i was going to be gone for a month or so and i certainly had no intention of i didn't know anybody no intention of going to sweden or setting foot in sweden and that took a while it was a, it's a you got a minute it's a, it took a little while um let's see i grew up in texas grew up in houston and I graduated from high school. Uh, I was when when I was a little boy, uh, since the cutoff date to get into kindergarten each year was September 1st and my birthday, September 28th. So my mother paid the school district uh, ten dollars so that I could go the year before the September 20th instead of she being stuck with me at home for another year. because We had already had four kids at the time. And, and there's another one. God knows why she had five kids. We got along great, though. My mom just doesn't seem like the kind of woman that would go, hey, five kids. Um, but so she paid extra. So I started school a year or I was the youngest person in my class every year. Right. So I left Texas and started university when I was still 17. I wasn't quite 18 yet. Mm -hmm. And so then I was in Connecticut and I went to Wesleyan University. I was there for four years. Then I did a little acting thing at the Edinburgh Festival or the Festival in Edinburgh. And that was summer of 1989. And then I moved to New York and I was in New York for a few years. It was all right, but I mean, New York's great. But a few years, I was very unhappy with not what I was, not so much what I was doing, but what people sort of pigeonhole you into what they think you're capable of. And, you know, when you say, I want to, you know, I'm going to try to do this. I want to work on this. You're like, yeah, right. Sure. You can, you know, and that's that kind of negativity of, because I can do anything I want. So uh, a friend of mine from, from Houston, the late, great Carlos Alonso, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, uh, came up to New York at the end of 1992 just because he knew I was not feeling pretty good. And he said, you know, what we should do is just get out of here for a little while. But we didn't really have any money, you know, um, and um, there were still bucket shops like Air Tech and Air Hitch then. So we bought one way plane tickets to Paris. And I had like 130 bucks on top of that. <laughs> I figured it would just go somewhere for a month and I don't know, work somewhere and get some money to go home. Right. And we didn't know anyone in France, but we knew a guy who lived in Lansut, Germany. So we spent most of the rest of our money going to Lansut, Germany to see Thomas Kufner and stay with him for a few days. This is the very beginning. This is early January, 1993. And uh, his dad um, was a, 
you know, like some German financier businessman named Wolfgang, which is always a cool name. That's always a plus, you know. Um, and he said to us one day, um, you know, uh, Czechoslovakia is just about to split apart into Czech and Slovakia, and they're going to change the currency. And I have some old Czechoslovak crowns from the 1970s, and, you know, it's like $200 worth of crowns, which is not worth a lot in Germany or the U.S., but was worth a lot in Prague at the time. So he Hell said, you, yeah. guys, you guys would really like Prague. And we're like, okay. So he gave us these Czechoslovak crowns. So we went to Prague. And I got there the day before Czechoslovakia split in half. And I spent a couple of very, very happy years in Prague. And then I lived, I lived in Turkey for a little while, in the Turkish Cyprus. Spent some time in, in, in Hungary. And then, I, then there was adventures in England and Scotland. This would take too long to explain all this. So trust me, it's really, it's really interesting. You gotta have me back. Already, yeah, I would love to. Part two. Already committed to part two. And um, then I, in Edinburgh in 1995, in the summer of 1995, me and a Scottish guy ran part of a chain of illegal youth hostels. Uh, there were some other guys had Prague, Budapest, and Vienna. And we opened one in Edinburgh because you could make money in a currency that was, you know, worth something outside of, say, Prague, you know. Sure. And a bunch of Swedes worked for me then. And uh, I wasn't going to do that again in 96. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I thought I should take a little vacation. So in February 1996, when I still, everything I owned, I could still carry on my back because you could back then. Uh, I knew a bunch of Swedes that lived in Stockholm. So I went to Stockholm and I thought, much like when I left the, left the States, I thought, I'll be gone for a couple of weeks, you know, maybe a month. And I guess I'm still on that trip technically. So that's how I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. Moves to uh, moves to Stockholm, Sweden. You are like the ultimate backpacker, I suppose. In oh, a I, sense. I very much was. I had some some of the most bizarre jobs. Sometimes you made absolute shit tons of money, and sometimes you were absolute destitute. But I didn't mind. It was the '90s. You know, it, the thing is, if you think things are going to work out, they might or might not work out. If you just know that it's going to work out, then it works out. Yeah, That's, absolutely. So what, that, I mean. When um, when uh, I had in Prague, I had actually the, the first Swedes I met. I met us. I was together with a Swedish a Swedish girlfriend in Prague, and well, we went down to Turkey together because she had spent a few years in Prague and didn't want another Czech winter. So we took the thirty six hour bus from from Prague to Istanbul, um, and, and you know Istanbul, as it turns out, is cold in winter, just as cold <laughs> as Prague is. Well, you know, I could have looked that up, but we didn't have the internet. So this is before yeah, speaking of that, what did your family make of your like disappearance, for lack of better words? I mean, you were just off the map. Could you keep in touch? The, only thing, the, the thing that my mom took issue with and still takes issue with is that when I ended up in Eastern Europe, I really wanted to restart everything. So I didn't tell anybody, not anybody, no friends, no family, nobody where I was for like six months. And my mom has a problem with that. She didn't mind me living my life or doing what I want to do. She had a problem with that. Um, other than that, though, it seems to be a pattern in my family. Like um, my dad's from New York. And when he finished graduate school, he was unhappy with what he was doing. He finished graduate school. Uh, he was, went to Brown and then NYU. He's a geophysicist. And so he signed up for an oceanographic expedition to do seismic mapping in the North Sea, a Norwegian thing somehow. Mm -hmm. And he went on, was on that ship and they ran out of money. So they said, well, we'll give you enough money to get back to me. He's like, hey, just give me the money and I'll stay in England for a while. So my dad moved to, that's where my dad met my mom was when he, he was, he was in England, right? And that works for, and my grandparents as well. My, uh, my mother's mother, was uh she's my, my mother's from london and her or from near london and her parents are were english and they but her parents met in egypt when um her mother was teaching in the schools in egypt because she left london because that's what apparently you do in my family and grandpa was the superintendent of schools for the british dominion of egypt so that's how he met grandma so apparently yeah, what we do in my family is the firstborn son goes to another country and does something else. Yeah, you're you're almost forcing me to be politically correct here because that is like breaking the stereotype of a Texan 
in ways I never conceived of before. So you, you well, guys are very international well, well, family. My, well, my New York dad and my English mom are very, very tech about it. They're in their 60s, and neither has any intention of leaving. So. I believe it. So you, you, you landed in Sweden, basically. Uh, what was it about the country that mesmerized you to the point that all these years later, you're there, you've got a wife, you're a citizen, you speak the language? Yeah. Um, it's funny because I had been living in places, you know, Prague, Edinburgh, New York, London, places that were... 24 hour cities that you could find something to do at five in the morning. You could find a beer if you wanted to, mm -hmm. where there was always something going on. And Stockholm wasn't really that unless you really knew where to go in the nineties, in the mid nineties. When I got there, it was February 96. I was completely broke and it was minus 10 degrees and it was cold and it was gray. I thought it was awesome. I, I, I don't know. I really liked the people. I really liked Swedes straight off the bat. Um, from the day I got there, I had a good time, but I certainly didn't plan on, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm moving here. But I, I had, even when I was a teenager in, in university, I had done voiceovers for a couple of local commercials and stuff like that. And I got cast, somebody, just a guy I knew, showed me a, a, a newspaper ad that they were casting um, American, English, Australian, whatever for the English language version of a popular Swedish cartoon, The Three Friends and Jerry, or Jerry or Hans Vanna, or Svenska in Swedish. And um, I went to the auditions, and me and an English guy got cast doing all of the grown-ups in the English language version of the channel. It was on American TV for a while in the late 90s and early 2000s. So I figured, well, I'd stick around for, you know, another month and, you know, do voices for cartoons, because why not? Um, and they, it just, you know, it sort of got longer and longer. Uh, I started playing with bands again and stuff like that. And, you know, it just, uh, yeah. So it just, it simply evolved. Now, the amount of voiceover work that you've done is really outstanding. I'm not sure what you're allowed to kind of like publicly I can talk about it. I'll tell you there's something. I'm, there's the only thing that I'm right now under NDA to talk about is a Swedish game. It come, doesn't come out for another couple of years. It's in development that I do the voice of the main character for. So I can't talk about that. You know? mm. But um, there's nothing else, as far as I'm aware, that I'm well, still yeah, under. So, 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 so please, brag, name drop. I mean, you've got some amazing uh, accolades. Let's see. Let's see. For years, for like 15 years, I did all the commercial and channel announcements for Nordic MTV, which is interesting because first they wanted me to be really American and talk like this, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then they, they they had new ownership, so they're like, no, can you do more British or some Scottish things? I remember one, there was thing, uh, MTV Access. I remember the commercial was, it would even hold my nostril. It was like, access all the stars, access all your favorites, MTV Access, Fridays at 8 on MTV. You know, those were fun. And then it was in Swedish with an American accent. Uh, and I, I hosted two of my own shows, actually, on Nordic MTV. Uh, I'm a good host, so that, that yeah, was 20 no years ago. Um, I was the voice for Carlsberg Beer worldwide outside of the United States for like five years. All of the Carlsberg, probably the best beer in the world. And Those you did it with that accent. Yeah, well, that's the Carlsberg voice. You have to do the Carlsberg voice. That's we designed. The thing is, when we did that voice, if people in America think, oh, is that an English guy? And people in England go, I think, no, nah, it's an Australian guy. If people in Australia yeah, yeah. think, it's an American guy. We actually sat and bent each of the vowels. So he's obviously a native English speaker, but no country will actually claim him. No, he's not, no, he's not South African. He's, he's got to be New Zealand or something. You know, that was uh, how that works. Incredible. Um, that Hit me with that one more time. Let's see. What was one of the other ones? There was only, let's see. Carlsberg, don't do flatmates. But if we did, they'd probably be the best flatmates in the world. That's yeah. something. That sounds really convincing. Well, you it know. should. Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely. Um, what about the, the video game you were in? Because that's, I think, a lot of people. I mean, I've done a Star lot Wars. of video. Well, let's be, let's be clear. I've done, I've, been in, I've done voices for at least 30 or 40 video games over the years. I've done a lot oh, of video my. games. Yeah, but sure, Star Wars part, is kind of cartoons a... Cartoons are the most fun. Cartoons are the most fun. But video games are the next most fun. Um, yeah, I did... Um, the only character in Star Wars Battlefront 2 who is not in any of the Star Wars movies is the droid who announces 
um, the heroes versus villains mode when you can be like, uh, like Han Solo fighting the emperor. You know, it's mm. like a one-on-one -on -one thing. And he's this sort of wisecracking droid. Thing is, you, because we crunched it, because I did the voice, like it was like, that is one bounty Boba Fett will not collect. And then they crunched it and metalized it and stuff. So I don't know if you'd really pick up that it was from me. That's but like I when an the, actor wears a costume or something, right? The characters and accents, obviously. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's incredible. But, you, you can also do the transatlantic accent, can't you? I could do a variety of accents, yes. Are you paying me to do something now? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, but I was going to say about, that, free. about the Star Wars thing. That was... um. Well, I told you already, but the, the funny thing about that was I wasn't actually hired to do that character because since I live in Stockholm and Dice, nice red tones, you know, it's the wine. Uh, Dice, who uh, is part of EA Games, who were doing the Star Wars game, their main, their, their studio, they have big studios in Stockholm. And I've done a bunch of work with them before. Like I wrote a lot of the codex for Battlefield 1. I've done different voiceovers and stuff for them before. But um, so I knew the, the sound guy, Raul, called me one day and he said, hey, listen, man, can you come in? We're doing the Star Wars Battlefront game. I'm like, you want me to do? He goes, no, we don't want you to do the Star Wars game. What we want you to do is because the, the characters are doing their own voices, like Billy D. Williams is doing Lando. That's, you know, they, they're doing the people who are doing who they do. Can you come in and do placeholder voiceovers for like 15 of the characters characters that, that have mouths because if they mm -hmm. if it's if there's just a mask then then they can do anything they want with the voice but to get because you do the voice first and then they do the timing of the character to match the mouth and voice acting in slightly different timing from regular acting and a lot of those actors like billy d williams are not voice actors they're actor actors so yeah i went in and i spent a couple hours and i did I did like 20 different characters for them. Just most of them only had like 30 or 40 lines. So it didn't take that long. But I was having fun when I was doing Yoda. I was doing like, mm -hmm, why is it the ways of the force is the young Jedi? And so I was getting into it. I was having a lot of fun, right? And I think nothing else. I, I walk away, go home. And like three months later, Raul calls me again. And he says, hey, just so you know, um, George Lucas and Lucasfilm really liked your placeholder voiceovers. And I was like, Cool. Wow. And, and he says, now, um, there's this one droid in the game. It's not in any of the movies. And would you like to do the voice for that droid? And I said, that's the stupidest question anyone has ever asked me in my life. Who would say no? Who would say no to doing that? So that's how I ended up doing that. And I went in and we did the droid. And he doesn't have a lot of lines. It only took like two hours to do all of all of his, you know, little white cracks and stuff. And then I realized when I was walking away, I am the droid they were looking for. <laughs> Indeed you were. Yeah. So well, and as all what? as all this is evolving, uh, you were also performing with Money Brother. All throughout or or at what point oh, did no, that start? Oh no, no, I left Money Brother in 2004. Um I played with a lot of a lot of Swedish bands. The, the band that was biggest with was Money Brother. I mean, we put that together at the end of 2000. And we had an EP that came out in 2000, February 2002. But the first album came out in, on May 9th, 2003, the album Blood Panic. And that suddenly went into the top 10 in a bunch of places. And it went gold and had a bunch of hits. And we won a Grammy. And we won the gold mic as Sweden's best live band. And I left the band at the end of 2004 already. But here's the thing. Now, in May 9th, is the 20th anniversary of the release of that album. So now me and Henrik were the first two to leave the original band, and we left in 2004. But we are putting together the original, the very original band for the first time since 2004 to play the 20th anniversary of that album in 2003, to play all those songs again. We're doing two shows. So that's upcoming. Stockholm. Yeah, but for the, it's May 9th and 10th. The first one sold out in 20 minutes. So obviously people still want us to play those Songs, which is a good feeling. Um, yeah. And we have a rehearsal on Tuesday, which I haven't played with those guys, with all those guys since, yeah, 19 years, since I left 2004. So that's, that's going to be, that's going to be super fun. That's a great little project to have. Um, that's played... amazing. And, and I, I assume that anyone who might know you uh, from YouTube wouldn't necessarily know that you've been 
uh, you know, on MTV that you were doing video game voices, beer commercials, like things that most of them probably encountered at some point. Uh, tell me, because you, you have kind of a unique perspective you can offer here. What is more interesting, like being a YouTuber? Because that's what I kind of knew you as, being a MTV host or being a kind of rock star. Like which, uh, which selection of celebrities suits you best? Well, the most fun thing to do when I'm actually doing it is playing music on stage. I enjoy that still. I mean, I still do solo shows as the organ slayer. I tour with the Mad Men bands. I play with, hop in with a bunch of different bands and stuff. It's fun to be an ex-rock star because you can say no to things instead of having to do stuff. <laughs> sure. But, um, but uh, I'm, I, I'm not certain which level of fame I would prefer. I mean, it's more fun to be famous as a historian than it was to be as a rock star because because they would recognize me, go, hey, you're that guy from Money Brother. Yeah. And then they just sort of stare at you, and that was it. People now, I'm running to somebody in the subway, they'll be like, wait, you're Indy Nidell from you know, the World War II channel. I'm like, yeah, they'll go, okay. In September 1942, you know, and they'll have, I'll end up having these like hour long discussions with, with, uh, with you know, strangers about, about historical stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, certainly, in, in, in that, in which, which, which fame do you prefer? I prefer the one that, that it has some more depth to it, although I don't didn't mind the other one at the time. It's, Wouldn't mind it now either. It's strange but because I, you. Know, yeah. No, I'm sorry that we we have a little bit of a sync issue going on, but I, I feel like a lot of people, myself included, would much rather make their living as a musician, touring, playing concerts. It's very romanticized, but um, YouTube is a powerful thing. But hang on a second. I didn't say which about making my living. I said I enjoyed the the recognition of being a historian more than okay than I did being a rock star which and which it was more fun to make my living from well I made more money playing music obviously when we got big we were making making a ton of money um yeah. but uh which that's one thing I I do a lot more work researching and writing like the world war ii show i'm doing the this d-day series and stuff this is a lot more work i really like the work though sometimes it can be too much but i you know i, I studied history at university I, i'm sure i'm an actual historian i have a piece of paper that says i'm a historian you know before all know that actually before, before eastern europe or anything i had a piece of paper that says yeah, that you're yeah. a historian um but it's funny because you know people t tend to think about historians as kind of nerdy bastards but you uh you're I'm breaking not. that stereotype as well, aren't you, right? Maybe I should just stop I'm stereotyping. Maybe that's the lesson from this yeah. interview. Um, in the, your, your level of recognition, though, is, is really something special. I mean, uh, we've talked about this before, but I've been, we were together in Ukraine, right? Yeah. I saw plenty of people come and say hello to you there. Sure. Uh, in, in Poland, same deal. Not to mention, I've had people come up to me and <laughs> you know say that they knew Indy Nidell, which I thought was pretty funny, right. just okay. by association. When we were in France together, I also saw pe plenty of people coming up. So it's 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 so widely spread. That's that's one thing. Like when we were when I was like at peak fame with Money Brother, I got recognized all the time in Sweden, Norway, and only in the cities. But we weren't really we were either underground or not well known in the rest of Europe. Uh, outside of that. Uh, once things got big with the Great War and World War II, I can be, I, you know, if I'm in, when I'm in Houston, I can be with my parents and get right. So it really is anywhere in the world now. It yeah. really is everywhere in the world now. Yeah, yeah. So that's the difference. So. Part of the reason I bring this up is because I, I want to know where are you taking that impact? Obviously, World War II is going to end. I don't know what's going to become of the channel. I, I hope that you guys will continue to do something like that. But you and Spartacus are both fucking crazy enough that I could imagine you're just like starting a whole new other channel or, you know, God knows what you guys will come up with. There's there's well, there's plenty of other plenty of other wars to cover. Um, I've told people several times I would like to do the Korean War because there's no good real documentary series on the Korean War. Certainly not week by week and certainly not because there's a whole over a year of it, which is complete total stalemate in the middle of it which since i have written world war ii and world war one I, I know i would be able to make that pretty exciting to cover the weeks like that so you'd still anticipate it without skipping a week or being bogged down i definitely want to do that 
we had an idea for how we might be able to do the hundred years war. <laughs> it wouldn't be week by week because I don't have any children and somebody's got to. <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> maybe that, we have maybe. an idea. But that's something. That's something for the future. But we have we have a we have a we have we have two. Well, Korea, I really want to do. There's another idea which I'm not going to talk about because it, I'm sure. really excited about it, but I don't want to spoil it. But like, uh, my question is more: What is the purpose of this for you? Like, fame is the effect, right? People know you from this work, but I don't, I don't see that you're doing this for that fame at all. I mean, you guys yeah. really work hard. Um, it's and we it's and it's hard. Work. Yeah, I mean, nobody's done. We did one. The Great War was the was the now. The, the, by the end of the war, I mean, they still continue the channel, but I don't have anything to do with that post-war. But that documentary is the largest, most in-depth documentary ever done on the First World War. Our, excuse me, I'll turn that off. Our Second World War channel is already the largest, most in-depth documentary on the Second World War that's ever done. Absolutely. And it's only going to grow bigger because we still have a bunch of war left. Um, there are specific things that someone may have dove deeper into particularly things places that are popular like stalingrad or something like that mm. that's fine but to tie it all together because we don't we don't do place oriented and battle oriented documentary series we do time oriented holistic and chronological documentaries to me it doesn't matter how much you know about the battle of stalingrad but if you don't know how it relates to Operation Torch and the Battle of Guadalcanal and the Second Battle of El Alamein and uh, the, the what was going on in Africa and Tunisia and the Casablanca Conference, which were all at the same time. If you don't know how that relates together, then you don't understand what was going on at Stalingrad. You just understand a battle and it might be cool because you like weapons. But that's so and history, sure. historical documentaries are still are are place based and event based instead of chronologically based. And that is something that we very much started in terms of films. I mean, you can read things that's this war day by day and somebody writes out events that happened, but that's that's a different thing entirely. Um, I think it's a lot harder than people think to do. And I think that because we've been doing this for nine years, we've obviously been successful and we've made some money and we're obviously famous. And yet we are the only people doing this. Yeah. There are channels that call themselves. There's the channel that calls themselves the Pacific War Weekly, but it's not. It has an episode that comes out weekly about the Pacific War, but it's still place based. It's the battle of this, the battle sure. of that, the battle of that. Um, dog, no, thank you. But I, I think that's that's much the case with a lot of the successful people who I speak with. You know, they, they have these unusual stories where, where they're just like an open book. Like, you know, you started a trip 30 years ago and you're still on the trip. Uh, yeah. You live in Sweden now, but I have the sense that you don't have a commitment to living there that is so firm that uh, you know you're sure that you'll you'll be buried there. Yeah? I, I I have a commitment to think? living in Sweden. I really like living in Sweden. I, I have a great life there. I have no, I can't see. I don't have any plans for the near, certainly for the foreseeable future of not living there. Uh, oh, I don't know what can hold later on in life, but yeah, I have a great life there. Sweden's great. You took on citizenship. What does that process? look like well i had permanent residency all the way back in 1997 back then i think it was a lot easier to get it for uh, for an american um because i turned up and after interviews with the you know the people left they, they gave me six months no they gave me a year the first time and at the end of that year i could do the interview in swedish the next year i thought okay you're a good credit risk you know so sorry there's a dog making a lot of that's okay. Um, but but um, I was perfectly happy to continue with permanent residency. You know, I couldn't vote in the national elections, but I could vote in the local elections. And that was the only real difference until Corona came around. I live there and we film here. I have to come to Munich every six or seven weeks to film six or seven weeks of the war. Mm -hmm. And because of the different governments' reactions to Corona, there were only 23 countries in the world by uh, May and June 2020 that would allow holders of an American passport in. And I still traveled on my American passport. So at the, uh, when I got back to, at the end of March, let's see, I was stuck here for like three weeks when Corona came. So I was in, in April, I was back in Sweden and 
I realized I was not necessarily going to be able to get back here to film. So I thought, well, I'll apply. I'll turn in my application for, to, for you know, Swedish citizenship finally after 23 years as a permanent resident. And people say that it could take six months or eight months or a year or whatever like that. Uh, less than two weeks later, I was holding a Swedish passport. So it went, I don't know why it went tremendous. Maybe because I, you know, I don't have a criminal record in Sweden. I don't have any, you know, like, you know, like debts or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't did know. you I feel don't... any different after becoming a citizen as I compared taller. to being a permanent I, I grew, resident? I grew, my heart grew three sizes like the Grinch does. And in, 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 in when he, when he discovers Christmas, that's, that's, that's the only thing that happened was my, actually in Sweden, it'd be your heart would shrink. So I, I would become more aloof and more distant. I became more distant and aloof. So, no, I didn't feel any distant. I just thought, you know, yeah, I don't know why I didn't do it earlier because it is much more convenient to wherever I have to travel to go, okay, which passport is more convenient to you? Hang on, I got to open the door to let this dog out, yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sense. Well, uh, <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, Indy is obviously not your average character <laughs> moving from the United States to Sweden and being so aloof to uh, taking on the citizenship that, uh, you know, decades pass uh, before you get it. Uh, obviously, he's he's back. I'm not very good at the I'm not very good at the filibuster. See, it would be better if I went somewhere. Oh, I'm good at filibuster. Sure. Oh, you're great at that. Yeah. You talk too goddamn much. I actually. do. I, I very, very <laughs> much do. Thank you. It's one yeah. of my good sides. Tell me, though, are you going to vote in Swedish elections? I just did. Uh, we had elections fairly recently. Because this is, this is one of those things. You know, I, I took on a citizenship of another country. I, I became Polish. And, um, you know, unlike you, it, it really meant a lot to me. It was an identity thing, actually, okay. I think. I never really identified with being American. Um, I never really got it, but you know, it was such an honor to take on a citizenship that wasn't like um, owed to you. Anyhow, you oh, know, yeah. so I, I, I really, I really, I took it strong. And yeah, yeah right. it was a I chose to become a Swede and they chose to let, to have me as a Swede. That's, I, that's I very special. much like being a Swede. Now, yeah, I have no, no traditional Swedish blood. Nobody on either side of my family has likely ever set foot in Sweden yeah. before, yeah. before I did. But, uh, well, but, but my point here is that I struggle with the notion to vote. Obviously, I have political opinions, but I kind of feel like I wasn't born and raised here. I respect the country as it was when I arrived. You know, at what point should I be entitled to interfere? What, at the point that I pay taxes and contribute to society? You know, it's, it's a weird kind of philosophical thing when you go to another country um, to actually uh, partake in. I politics. was happy to exercise my right, even when I could vote in, in the municipal elections, I got, um, you know, full citizenship. Um, I would all, I, I, I'll vote in any elector that I'm allowed to vote in, basically. Yeah. So if, if you have, yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's a fine thing. I, you know, maybe I've got a little bit of a complex uh, or something. You know, I don't feel truly Polish to the end. But like you mentioned that you don't have Swedish blood. So, and I often yeah. ask people this question about being Polish. And I think it applies here as well. What do you think makes one Swedish? Spending time in Sweden. You know, it, 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 when I would, it was really more in the 90s and 2000s when I met someone, you know, and they'd say, where are you from? I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm in fact American. Like, or like you like Irish American or, you know, French American or Italian American. I, I didn't give a shit about that. Sure. I have parents and great grandparents. I don't understand. I never understood that because five generations ago, you a bunch of people came over from Ireland that you're somehow Irish. I don't feel that. I just felt I was American because that's where I got the cultures, the culture and values and touchstones that I grew up with. So that's what made me me. Now I have Swedish ones as well. Uh, since Absolutely. 96, I have Swedish values and touchstones and Swedish cultural, you know, markers. So. I, I'm happy well, to yeah, call myself. A, in my case, living outside of the United States is what made me realize that I'm American. I didn't understand it was when I was there because of this uh, association we keep oh, yeah. 
to our past heritage. Uh, what are Swedish values? Mm. Well, Swedish values in Swedish culture is very interesting. Last, say, 130 years, Sweden has had, in spite of not being at war and not being part of either of the world wars actively, I mean, mm -hmm. it would be effective, um, has had probably more cultural changes to it than anywhere else I know in Europe. Even the Russia that had to go through the Soviet Union and, say, Germany that ended up being on the losing end of... Now I'm going to close this door because the dog came in again. Sorry. Hold that thought. Here, don't worry. You don't have to make small talk. I'm coming right back. You, you can sing the theme. It's a good... Da, 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 uh, thank you. Um, um, a perfect time. That's a true um, professional. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. In the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s, Sweden was the poorest in Europe. And... It had such massive alcoholism that you had like seven, eight-year-old kids drink vodka for breakfast. That's just what mm -hmm. you do. That it was. And you, the first, first late, this shows how messed up the place was. The first laws was that if you worked in a factory where, of course, you got fed by the factory owner because you lived in the factory. You know, that was how it often was, factory towns. So if you worked in a factory, at least one day a week, they had to feed you something that was not salmon, right? That was that was like the first labor. It was, it's, oh my! The first, it's, it's, you can't you know you, you can't just have the same shitty food day after day after day after day. Um, it's a big change for Sweden. Actually, the first you know, in the eighties when you had like Live Aid and Band Aid and all the money and food for Ethiopia, the first country that Europeans rallied around to do that for was Sweden in the eighteen nineties. They were all starving. Um, first World War changed things a lot. To have, although it had a lot of hardships financially, by the end of the war, or something was built in, said 1917 on the front. That whole neighborhood was built in 1917, 18. Show me one other place in Europe that had a building boom in 1917 and 1918. Yeah. Uh, 1904, because it was a very, very good structured class society. Uh, based and the 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 largely alcoholic poor were still part of a rigid predestination form of Protestantism of Lutheranism. Uh, that all changed began changing in the teens and twenties and thirties, particularly the first. Um, um, no, that's party when the first social democrat prime minister uh, came in nineteen twenty four. I'm not going to give you a whole Swedish history. But sure. the cultural values, and then once the whole dance band thing, which was the first real musical movement in the country, came in the 30s, and then the backlash, the dance band Irland, that the, the, this evil, the contract, the contract between the businessmen and the labor leaders, that the taxes would be very high, but you would be protected from the cradle to the grave. That that social contract produced the Swedish model that lasted until it was unsustainable by the 70s. But by then, uh, Sweden was no longer what it was in the 19-teens and 1920s. You didn't have you know, a book that you could only buy a certain amount of alcohol a month at at the state-run monopoly because you can't with booze because you're all alcoholics. You didn't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. You still have people that still show out Monday, Friday, and then on Saturday into a lamppost, there's still a certain segment of people doing that stuff but um it was it became a much much more cosmopolitan by the 60s by the 70s thanks to the swedish model you see um and it more attractive too i mean sweden now has it's like 12 percent of the population is poor which is a lot for parts of europe um but swedes you see the swedish environment is responsible for skype and spotify and this is, I think, is de definitely because of the attitude Swedes has, Swedes has to work, which I have taken on. Uh, I work at my pace. And as long as I get the work done, nobody has a problem with that. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I can't emphasize enough that the Sweden of years ago, or the Sweden before the 20s, is a completely different animal, more so than Russia and the Soviet Union or the German Empire, the German, the modern German Republic. What about the, what about family relations and 
culture and food because you know I've I've been to Sweden many times and especially in the first impression it doesn't seem that dissimilar to places I grew up in or knew when it comes to you know kind of how people interact and and the food there's a fair amount of family relations I mean but you could say that it's funny you can say that about most places in Europe most places in the world, you know especially when out of the cities and out of the young crowds, you, and you have a lot of traditional structure, a lot. It's, it has a lot. It's similar to Northern Central European food. There's meat and potatoes and there's fish and potatoes in a variety of different forms. And when it's really good, it's really good. And when it's, bad, it's inedible, say that about German food too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's very true. Uh, before we wrap up here, I just want to ask you a few gossipy uh, kind of questions. Uh, so for context, when um, we met in uh, France last uh, September, I believe it was, uh, Spartacus picked us up from the airport and he was like, mm -hmm. guys, we're going to run out of gas. Uh, long story short, we didn't. It was the middle of the night. We were searching through Paris for a gas oh, can. Uh, to buy gas. Yeah, it was, a, it was a disaster. Turns out you guys have had that exact same situation like not even long ago, before, where you ran no. out of gas. What is this yeah, chaos that, that you live in? It was, it was France's fault, but it was in Luxembourg. Um, <laughs> we're driving up to Luxembourg to do this filming, thing, and we had, like, there's a road just along the even French border, and we're like, we're running out of gas. Well, we'll find an exit. Well, I mean, there's nowhere to get gas. And we find that the, the, the you know, car died but Sparty who's a good driver a hill and was to go like two and a half hours down that hill just rolling and rolling finally rolled into a little truck resting area rolled to stop there we bought some gas from a driver that was there a gas can to get us uh, into uh Unbelievable. Yeah, we had dozens of kilometers before it happened. We just couldn't find a place for gas. This was just different. This was just there were yeah. no gas stations open at 10 o'clock at night or whatever, or 12 o'clock at night. I remember it's, the one that closed right when we got up there. Right when we got up there, the guy closed. Yeah, he closed. I was just telling my daughter that story, actually. It was pretty uh, It was pretty ridiculous. But um, it's, it's, it's amazing to me because you two are – some of the most successful people I know, and yet you live in this very chaotic kind of way. At least that's my perception. Chaotic, huh? controlled chaos. You know, yeah, yeah. I can tell you exactly how it works because I know from the outside people go. All right, I think that uh, we lost him there, but um, that's Indy Nidell with the world's worst internet connection, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully him and I will have a chance to catch up and um, continue this conversation in purpose, in purpose, in person. And um, anyways, I thank him for being a guest and sharing his uh, fascinating, crazy stories. Thank you guys for watching.